Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon. Welcome. For those of you just coming in, if you'd rather not stand in the back of the room, it's getting kind of crowded back there. We actually have an overflow room right next door that you can go sit in, and we'll be showing the whole thing in there as well. So feel free to use that room if you want to. Welcome. My name is Kevin Schofield. Uh, I work here in Microsoft Research, and it's my honor and privilege today to introduce Dr. Nathan Mervold, who's visiting us as part of the Microsoft Visiting Speaker Series. He's here today to discuss his new six-volume, 2,400-page Modernist Cuisine, The Art and Science of Cooking. Uh, looking to reinvent cooking, science-inspired techniques reveal how to prepare food that ranges from the otherworldly to the sublime. This book is a truly unique contribution to the craft of cooking and our understanding of its underlying principles. Nathan is CEO and a founder of Intellectual Ventures, a firm dedicated to investing both expertise and capital in the development of inventions. In addition to stimulating the in inventions of others, he is himself an active inventor with nearly 250 patents issued or pending, including several related to food technology. I bet you find that difficult to believe. Um, <laughs> He's probably going to be mad at me for saying this, but Nathan is really a true Renaissance man. He earned a doctorate in theoretical and mathematical physics and a master's degree in mathematical economics from Princeton University, and has since extended his research interests to other fields. His work has been published in Science, Nature, Paleobiology, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and the Physical Review, and he's contributed articles to the Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Time, and National Ge Geographic Traveler. As most of you know, in a prior life, Nathan was the first chief technology officer at Microsoft, and back in 1991, he founded Microsoft Research. Nathan has been quoted as saying that he left Microsoft in 1999 because it was getting in the way of his cooking. <laughs> <laughs> but we're thrilled to welcome him back today. Please join me in welcoming Nathan Merville. Well, it's great to be back at Microsoft, and... Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the book. So here is a picture of it. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite a thing. Um, here's some of the fun facts. Six volumes, 2,438 pages, 1.1 million words. If you put those words in a single line of text, it would be seven and a half miles long. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but, <laughs> but you could. Um, we took 150,000 pictures. And 3,200 of them were good, so we put them in the book. Um, 1,522 uh, recipes. Uh, we had recipes that were inspired by or adapted from 72 of the world's greatest chefs. We had six research cooks working on the project for three years full time, uh, plus those 72 people outside. Uh, 44 writers, editors, uh, art staff contributed to the book. Uh, yeah, I have to say, the fact that I had a background at Microsoft is a large part of the reason I wrote the book and did it the way I did. Uh, because I realized at a certain point that there was an opportunity to do a book like this, but it wasn't an opportunity to write a book by yourself. Uh, it, because it was too big, and, and there's no way that a single person could have done all of this. And if I hadn't spent lots of time working on software, uh, I wouldn't have thought you could do it, but I thought, hey, I, Hey, 44 people, this is nothing. <laughs> you know, we, we had that much just on one tiny part of one tiny uh, uh, thing at Microsoft. Um, 40 pounds altogether. And here's my favorite statistic of all for the book, four pounds of ink <laughs> in one volume. Isn't that amazing? The, the printers make a blank book for you to, as a mock-up. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, gee, is it really going to be the same? They said, well, it'll be heavier. I thought they meant the paper and they said, I said, well, why is it heavier? They said, the ink. I said, you're kidding me. They said, well, a full page photo has a thousandth of an inch uh, of ink on it. You have a full page photo or a half page photo on most of your pages, 2,400 times a thousandth. <laughs> it's like a big chunk of ink. Um, so one of the questions I asked is, OK, ink, why ink? Why isn't it digital and online? And so this is a picture we took to sort of show that. Um, the fact is, if you want to deliver big, beautiful, high-resolution photographs, there's actually no better way to do it than paper at the moment. Um, now, we also made our decision as to what platform to target two years ago. Uh, 
And two years ago, we made the decision there was no iPad. We knew something like that would come out, but it was, would have been crazy for us to bet on it before it even existed. Kindle was out, but on Kindle, it's just beyond. I, I love my Kindle for text-based books, for novels and things. But for a picture-oriented book, Kindle's pretty bad. Um, you, you could make an interactive version of the book, of course, and I think we will eventually. But a lot of people have this attitude of, oh, you should have made it um, uh, interactive so it could be cheap. And I say, boy, you, you don't understand how that works. <laughs> you know, if you made it interactive and you really made it cool so that you had animations and videos and lots of embedded interactive uh, features, then it's actually a lot more work um, and potentially be even more expensive than it would be the other way. So um, that's why it's on paper. Uh, we also made a, a lot of effort to try to have good quality paper. Um, so it, the first column, you can see the sort of standard half toning, which is kind of pathetic. Um, we wind up using the one all the way at the other uh, side, I guess all the way on your right, uh, something called stochastic screening. Now, interestingly enough, we have some patents on stochastic screening that I was a co-inventor on at Microsoft <laughs> way back when. Because we realized we first started doing... Um, Putting, back in my day, study, it sounded like your grandpa, but <laughs> I mean, putting pictures into Windows was like a big deal. Um, putting fonts was like a really big deal. Um, but one of the things that we realized is, of course, when you have digital technology, you don't have to half tone on a regular grid. Y you can mix it around. And by, uh, by mixing around, you get a much better result. In fact, one of the guys who worked on uh, Windows 2.0 GDI is actually sitting in the front row here. Um, we also tried to have wide gamut inks. Uh, the gray here on the one side shows you what industry standard inks would do to this picture. Now, of course, you can always try to tweak it to make it a little bit similar, but we sprang for the wide gamut inks, uh, which lets you print the whole thing. There's always some things you can't print. You know, obviously, if you take a photograph of the sun, uh, you're not going to get a sunburn by looking at it. <laughs> okay? You can't possibly have the full spectral response. But the closer you can come, the better quality the pictures are going to be. Uh, so now I'll just walk through some of the volumes and say what's in, in them. Volume 1 is called History and Fundamentals. And it's mostly about things that aren't in any cookbook. Uh, cookbooks don't talk about history. Uh, they don't talk. We have a whole chapter on microbiology. We have chapters that talk about physics, uh, the physics of heat the physics of water, um, chapters on food safety, uh, even chapter on nutrition. So this is very non-traditional for a cookbook, but we thought it was important because uh, sort of the, the motivation of the book is we realized that there was lots of uh, information from science that people had realized about cooking over the course of the last 20 years. Um, there's a very influential book uh, called On Food and Cooking published by a friend of mine, Harold McGee. And he started a trend of people really understanding science in the kitchen. So there's all that body of knowledge. There's also a whole set of techniques that chefs had invented. Uh, but both the science knowledge and the chef knowledge was very difficult to learn. There was no big standard place you could learn it. You might get snippets of it here and there, but there was no big standard textbook. I thought, well, God, if I could pull all that stuff together in one place, it would really be a service to people trying to learn it. And I knew that because I was trying to learn it. <laughs> it's one of the things that after leaving Microsoft, I had a lot more time for cooking. Um, and I was learning all of these state-of-the-art techniques and trying to talk to chefs around the world and say, hey, how do you do this? What are you up doing with that? I realized they didn't, hadn't told each other how to do it. So there's an opportunity to this fundamental book. But if you do the fundamental book, you kind of want to explain why, or at least I did. And I think that's one of the things that separates this book from most cookbooks. We try to tell you why, as well as how, and what. Uh, most cookbooks are about the what, the recipes. I have a whole set of recipes, and a recipe says, do this, do this, do this, and it'll work. Don't worry about it. That's not very satisfying if you're a curious person and you want to understand more about it. It's also not very useful if the techniques that they assume are ones you don't know how to do. If it's a standard technique, it's about sautéing, or about anything like that, you can get lots of big, thick books that will teach you all of the basics of French cuisine, or all the basics of Italian or, or Chinese cuisine. There was no book like that for modern cuisine. That's why we wrote the book. Uh, volume 2 
takes a, a technique and equipment oriented view of cooking. It starts with about a 200 page chapter about traditional cooking, where we explain how traditional cooking actually works. What are the physical principles and other things behind roasting, baking, frying. Um, and we do that by using really cool photos, which we'll show some pictures of. There's one right there of the uh, broccoli steaming in a pot. Volume 3 takes an ingredient-oriented view of cooking, and the two principal ingredients in our food are animals and plants. And so here we discuss meat science, you know, what, what's the structure of muscles, what makes some uh, meat cuts tough, some tender. Uh, what's the difference between organ meats and uh, muscle meats? What's the difference between fish, poultry, and uh, mammal meat? Uh, in plants, we do a similar thing for plants, describing all of the different aspects of plants, along with lots of recipes. Volume 4 takes a perspective of, we call it ingredients and preparations. This is about more uh, detailed ingredients in the broad categories like animals and plants. So we have a chapter on thickeners. Because a lot of cooking is about how to make a sauce thick or how to make a soup thick. Uh, well, there's some great modern ways of doing that as well as a lot of traditional ways. We discuss both and try to put them in context. Uh, emulsions are another example of a chapter in here. Now, mayonnaise is an emulsion. Cream is an emulsion. Right? The milk, in fact, is a natural emulsion. It comes out of the cow that way. Uh, understanding how you make emulsions. You, you take oil and water, two things that really don't want to mix and you sort of make them temporarily mix, is a really important part of cooking, so we've got a, a chapter on that. Uh, as well as chapters on gels, on foams. Uh, finally, we have chapters on wine and coffee, because those are really important beverages, or important part of cooking. Uh, but uh, they're, they're treated very differently. Um, wine is treated almost like it's a separate topic from cooking, and it's almost a religion. You know, you know you're supposed to sort of bow and be respectful to the bottle of wine. Um, we have a technique we discuss called hyperdecanting. This is where you throw wine in a blender and hit it on fra frappe. Uh, so it, it's kind of a very irreverent view of wine. We also have a chapter on coffee, because damn it, we're from Seattle. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things we say in the book is that most great restaurants in the world, most Michelin three-star restaurants, the best restaurants in the world, have coffee that would not be fit for a street vendor in Seattle. Because if you're a street vendor in Seattle, you have to have really good coffee. <laughs> Um, and so we describe state-of-the-art espresso technique and lots of stuff about all the details of making coffee. Finally, we have two other volumes. Volume 5 is called Plated Dish Recipes. This is the only volume that really looks like a cookbook. If you go to a, cook bo a bookstore and you open up a cookbook, a cookbook is supposed to have a big full-page picture of, of the food on one side and the recipe on the other side. And you flip a page and there's some more and so forth. So we actually have that here because this volume although there's literally more than a thousand recipes up to this point, this volume uh, describes them in the terms of whole plated dishes or whole meals. Throughout the rest of the book we'll say here's a great way to cook chicken, here's a great way to make a sauce. Um, we might have a suggestion you'd use a sauce with a chicken but we don't put it all together. Here it really is about making an entire dish with all of the accoutrement and in most cases we go beyond the dish to have the side dishes and often the entire meal. Now we had a principle making the book which is um, any kind of food is sort of all equally legitimate and equally a possible topic of, uh, of refinement and improvement. So we have one of our recipes in here is for a hamburger. And if you really care about hamburgers and you really want to make the ultimate hamburger, you can and you can laugh as a lavish as much care on that as you would on some dish that might sound like a very fancy French dish that you're supposed to lavish care on. Well, actually, you can do it for, with either one. And if you're really into the refinement, what the hell, we'll tell you all the way. So we went way overboard in trying to figure the ultimate way to, to, to make a hamburger. Um, and we do that for roast chicken and for southern barbecue. Um, uh, after we did the barbecue chapter, one of our uh, uh, one of our chefs is Indian, and she says, oh, come on, curry's kind of like barbecue. And so, by God, we did a whole thing on Indian curries. Um, uh, you can't write a 2,400-page book if you're good at saying no. I think this is one of the things I've learned. Um, so, we also have a sixth volume. Uh, these volumes are large, they're physically e enormous. Um, 
that's great for having big uh, copies of the uh, uh, of the, the you know, seeing the the photos and so forth, but it's kind of big to balance on a counter, and it's kind of too pretty to balance on a counter. So we thought about how can we get the recipes in a form you could take in the kitchen. We ultimately hit on having a eight and a half by eleven, so somewhat smaller format book, spiral balance. You can fold it back on itself, on waterproof washable paper. So if you spill on it, you can get off. So here's some of the pictures. Um, we hit on this idea early on of what we call the cutaway photo, where we show you the magic view inside food while it cooks. Uh, and then we annotate these in the book with lots of details to show here's exactly how this works, here's what's going on here, here's what's going on there. Um, so this is a case of boiling water canning, and if you look closely, you see we cut the jars in half too. Um, here's a, another great photo. Here's a photo, a cutaway photo of a centrifuge jar. So a centrifuge is a fantastic uh, tool. Um, it spins liquid in these little jars, and it spins them fast enough that they experience a force equal about 40,000 times Earth's normal gravity. Now that causes any difference in density or weight to be dramatically magnified, and so things separate it out. So this is a um, Hungarian goulash sauce that we put in there, and uh, it's separated into eight different layers um, by... Uh, uh, by the force of gravity, e each one having a different characteristic density. Uh, here's where we're um, searing some fish. This is some pomegranate seeds. Here's our cutaway of um, a pot roast. This is um, grapefruit sections that we've peeled with an enzyme, which causes the um, outer uh, uh, membranes to become loose. You can just pull them right off. This is potato starch. Or actually, this is a potato. The starch is the purple granules. The blue lines are the cell walls of the potato. Uh, each cell has got a bunch of granules inside of it. So here's an example of one of those cutaway photos. This is actually the first picture I took for the book. Um, and it shows uh, broccoli that's steaming. And then if the, the various sidebars will explain things. In this particular case, we have a section about how uh, steaming, although theoretically steaming ought to be higher, faster heat transfer than boiling, in practice it isn't for most vegetables. And that's because actually there's a film of condensation that forms on the outside. So steaming, um, we thought it should be faster, theoretically it's faster, lots of books say it's faster. Our damn experiments showed it was slower. So then we look it up, we discover a food science journal uh, paper from 1946, so this guy says, you know, it ought to be faster, but damn it, it's slower. <laughs> um, so we had a little sidebar on that. Here's our uh, walk picture. Uh, now, a lot of people ask how we took these pictures, and they assume that this is all digital photo magic with Photoshop. And of course they're digital photos, and of course we use Photoshop, but no, we really cut stuff in half. So that walk is cut, it turns out in that case it's not quite cut in half, about a third of it is cut off. So there's still a little bit of the bowl of the walk underneath. Um, and we discovered why people don't cut their walks in half normally. <laughs> um, the oil kept getting to the fire, so this caught fire three times. Uh, so you know, if you want to do cutaway photos, you have to be willing to make a hell of a mess. Um, but we have this great motto, which is, it only has to look good for a thousandth of a second. <laughs> the rest of the time it can be horrible. And if we get that right thousandth of a second, um, it's all set. So here we can see another example of us zooming in and, uh, and showing all of what's going on. Uh, here's our hamburger cutaway. So in some of the cases where we're containing a liquid, we would glue a piece of glass. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But here, those coals are just sitting there on the edge of this Weber barbecue we cut in half. And so they kept falling off, and they'd fall, roll onto the floor. We'd put them back with the tongs really quick, take the shot, and then, oh, shit, something would fall again. Um, and in fact, the part that required lots of digital photo magic um, and some technique called HDR and so forth is that the amount of light you get off those coals is, of course, very much l less than the amount of light you get when you, you pop the flash to, to photograph the, um, uh, the burgers. So the exposure does require lots of digital photo manipulation and, and uh, algorithmic magic. Um, the cutaway shot, you just cut stuff in half. In fact, here's how you cut stuff in half. This is our machine shop. 
Um, and this is, uh, my company has got this, in fact, this is right down the street. Um, it used to be the Bellevue Harley Davidson Service Center. Um, and so we still get these guys that look like came out of a ZZ Top video come in and say, oh, where, where'd the Harley place go? <laughs> um, so I actually have a film here. This is a wire EDM machine. Uh, and here we're using it to cut a pot. The way this machine works, it passes a lot of current through a very thin wire. And sparks jump off the wire. It's sparks that actually cut the metal. So you can see the sparks there flying. And it turns out that, that you, you have more control over the sparks if you do it underwater, believe it or not. So this is a sped up a little bit. It's not quite this fast, but there you go. There's uh, cutting a pot in half. Um, so as a result, we have two halves of one of the best kitchens in the world. Um, uh, here you can see one of the tricks that we would do. This You can, can't see it super well here, but there's a piece of Pyrex. Uh, heat resistant glass that's been glued in front of this uh, pot with this high temperature uh, silicone. Unfortunately, the only sil silicone we could get that was high enough temperature is red. Um, but the great thing is when you cut a pot in half, you have two halves. So what we would do is we would photograph this all put in, in place. Then we would take the other half and put it in. So we'd photograph just that little edge and we would swap the bits out for the edge. So we do that. It, it's very much the way in a Hollywood movie uh, they'd have people fly through the air supported by a wire, and then you digitally take out the wire. Um, here's our heat and energy chapter. Uh, so we have partial differential equations in the book. We are the only cookbook with partial differential <laughs> equations. May also end up being the last cookbook with partial differential equations. Um, I actually wrote thousands of lines of code in the process of writing this book uh, because we created uh, programs to simulate heat, heat flow and simulate all kinds of other aspects uh, of, uh, of various processes going on with food. In fact, here's, here's the general heat equation. Um, <laughs> here's more detail. I figured this is a nerdy enough audience, like, it would be okay if I brought those up. It, here's an example, actually, of one of the calculations. Suppose you have got a grill and the grill is glowing super hot. Well, the way that heat is leaving that grill and going to your food is via infrared radiation. And it's bouncing around a bunch. So here's the grill. And if we assume that that's the part that's all equally hot, how does the uh, radiation, and therefore the intensity of cooking, fall off as you move away? Now, if it's very, very far away, it should go like the inverse square law. But that's only when it's on the other side of the room, and it's so far away that the, the cooking aspect just doesn't matter at all. So, in fact, I wrote a simulation to simulate all of this. And that led to this thing here, this weird horn-shaped thing. This is what we call the sweet spot. So this is the range uh, where the side-to-side the -side variation is within 10%. Because if you're cooking something, you really don't want to have a huge fall-off so that one edge of your steak is raw and the other one is, is, um, is overcooked. Or if you're cooking lots of things, have, you know, the ones in the center cook, get cooked more than the edge. So you want to know where that is. And it's interesting, it has this, uh, this sort of a horn shaped, it's a power law horn um, that comes out. And we discovered quite a few things by doing this very in-depth modeling. Uh, here's an example of one of our step-by-step -step things. And this is about graining the ultimate hamburger. So it turns out if you really are into hamburger, little things matter, including the alignment of the grain in the hamburger. So if we zoom in here, um, you can see how we do it. Uh, as these little uh, cylinders of meat come out of the grinder, you just pass the thing back and forth, trying to, as much as possible, align those grains. And when you can do that and you slice it, what it means is all of the grain of the meat is sort of perpendicular. If here's the patty, it's all perpendicular which means when you bite it, you're biting it uh, with the grain, and it's, it's easier to bite. Now, the reason why that's important is it's really annoying if uh, when you bite a sandwich, if when you pull it away, some things are tougher than other things, because then you pull them out when you pull it away from your mouth. It's supposed to all like cut cleanly. So it's a little point, but if you're graining your own hamburger meat, by God, this makes a difference. Um, we have a whole variety of other things about the ultimate hamburger. Um, including we cook it with liquid nitrogen. Um, the, uh, I mean, don't you? <laughs> so the, uh, the best way we found to actually cook the meat is to first cook it via a technique called sous vide. Um, 
But we don't cook it, normally in sous vide you seal things in a vacuum bag, but if you seal the hamburger in a vacuum bag, the atmospheric pressure will com condense the burger more than we like it condensed. So we do it in a Ziploc bag or in a sous vide bag that you don't seal, and so you have to hang the top outside the uh, outside. Well that cooks at medium rare, but you'd like to have the burger be crispy and browned on the outside. Well we tried lots of ways of doing that, and our favorite way is we take the cooked burgers, all been cooked perfectly medium rare, and we put it in liquid nitrogen for 30 to 45 seconds. Now that gets it really cold, and then we put it in a deep fryer. <laughs> um, and I, it sounds crazy, but it's a great mix. Because what happens is you freeze a layer of meat that comes inside, and that makes a thermal barrier. So the heat transfer uh, to the, on the outside of the burger from the, the hot fat is so fast, it easily browns it. It can overcome the heat, but you don't overcook the inside. And if you time it right, you get the perfect burger. And here is the perfect burger. Um, it really helps to make burgers on the space station because there's no gravity. Um, <laughs> In the book, we discuss actually each component of this. We make the bun. There's a special way you make the bun, and there's an amino acid called L-cysteine that if you add it prevents the gluten from getting uh, too tough because you want a really soft bun. Um, that isn't mayo. That's a beef suet mousseline, and we have a whole thing on how to make that. That's a special mushroom patty. We infuse the lettuce with uh, smoke to make a smoke-flavored lettuce, vacuum-compressed tomato, by God, we make the cheese. Um, it turns out that in 1916, a guy named James Kraft invented a way of making cheese melt perfectly. And that was the foundation of the Kraft Cheese Company. And you all know that product is Velveeta. And the basic idea was if you added some stabilizers, you could keep the emulsion in cheese stable even when you melted it. Um, and it, sodium citrate is the simplest stabilizer that you, that you can add. Well, the trouble with Velveeta is it tastes like Velveeta, so we wanted a Swiss cheese <laughs> thing. So we describe how to make, make your own Velveeta, basically, um, out of uh, Gruyere and Emmental cheese, or basically any cheese that you'd like. And I already told you about that. This is mushroom ketchup. So that's our, our ultimate burger. Come on, you can do it. There. Oh, so... Here's one of our fun toys in the, in the lab. Uh, we have a video camera that will shoot at HD resolution. I'll do that one more time just because, whoops. So the part I love about this is nobody's told the water it's time to fall yet. Um, so this is very much, as a kid, I'd watch these Wile E. Coyote cartoons, and the coyote runs off the cliff but doesn't fall until he looks down. Well, evidently the water isn't going to fall until it looks down. The reason for that is actually quite interesting. Um, it's because the balloon has a little mass. Now watch this closely and I'll tell you what it is. So, we have a chapter on gels. And I decided no chapter on gels would be complete without a recipe for ballistics gelatin. <laughs> so, by God, we have a recipe for ballistics gelatin. I figured, hey, on CSI or Mythbusters, we all see ballistics gelatin. Well, we made a block of it. Mm, we have a high-speed camera. Pretty soon, someone's going to go get a gun. <laughs> uh, watch closely. This is a kernel of popcorn. Watch it expand and expand and expand and voila. So the point behind this is that when water boils into steam, it expands by a factor of 1600. What's happening here is this little jet, you can't see it, but there's a little jet of steam coming out. You can watch this expand as it's trying to relieve the pressure. It can't relieve it fully and so it expands it, and, and explodes. And so that's how popcorn actually works. And we use this as an illustration of the book of uh, this important principle, because that water expanding by a factor of 1600 is super important in cooking. Uh, that's why it takes so much energy to boil water. Uh, that's why pressure cookers work, and there's a whole variety of things that that's essential to. Well, if you want to make an omelet, you've got to break a few eggs. And if you've got a res recipes for omelets and you've already been shooting some ballistics gel, <laughs> I, I can't say as there's a tremendous amount of real cooking points to it, but <laughs> God, we just watch it over and over again in the lab. <laughs> so um, that's all I have for this. I'm happy to take some questions if there's time. 
Yes? How was the hamburger? Uh, well, I, I think the hamburger is great. But the interesting thing about comfort food items like that is that people have their own very personal notion of it. Um, uh, there was a restaurant critic uh, who tried our hamburger. Uh, who's normally he's a very sophisticated restaurant critic, but he says, "Oh, come on! Shouldn't it be greasy and overcooked?" I said, mm, "Not the way I like it." But hey, if you've got everyone has their own favorite. So for our favorite approach, which largely means my favorite approach, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Uh, but you really have to appreciate the subtleties. There's plenty of burgers that are really good. They just aren't that good. Yes. Uh, of course, if you take it really professionally, you could possibly grill burgers in the exhaust fuel of the rocket engine. But how much of that is actually implementable by mere mortals um, <laughs> if I were to actually buy it? There's no mortals here. You all work for Microsoft. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so that's a really good question. And it's a question we often get. How many, how many of these recipes and techniques can you actually do? And there's a couple of answers to that. So my normal answer is I say about half the recipes in the book anybody could do. If you're willing to go buy some stuff at the kitchen store, um, uh, but only things at a kitchen store, you don't have to do anything super exotic, you can probably push that to 75%. And that last 25%, that's quite adventuresome. Um, now, there are people who say, oh, well, come on, this isn't really for people at the home. But in fact, Online, on, uh, there's a site called eGullet. There's this huge enthusiastic set. There must be 50 or 100 people who are all cooking all these recipes at home. And sitting over here in the front row is Scott Heimdinger here of Microsoft, who is also a Seattle food geek. And uh, he was cooking all these things at home before he even knew how. <laughs> um, uh, so it's certainly possible to, you know, that the, there's a liquid nitrogen you can buy lots of places. It's actually very cheap. Um, there's services that deliver it, in fact, because they deliver it to doctor's offices and things like that. And in fact, I get it delivered to my house in Medina. And the guy always says, you know, I don't have any other homes on my route. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over there. My question is, can you recommend a good Redmond area source for liquid nitrogen? Oh, there's, um, you know, actually, if you email, uh, see Amy over here, we will send you exactly who we use. Liquid nitrogen costs less than bottled water, okay? It, it's, uh, it, it, people think it must be really exotic, but 78% of the air in this room is nitrogen. And all you have to do is make it cold and it becomes this, this liquid. And it, it's great fun, and people think that it's like really dangerous. If you work hard enough, anything can be dangerous. But if we had liquid nitrogen, I'd stick my hand in it. Um, I'd pull it out really fast afterwards, <laughs> but I would stick my hand in it, whereas you would not get me to stick my hand into a deep fryer, for example. Yeah, down there? How much uh, space do you devote to baking? None. Um, so he asked how much uh, do we, space do we devote to, to baking. Although I found it hard to say no to things, we had to draw the line somewhere. So we have, in principle, we have no uh, uh, coverage of baking, pastry, or dessert. Now, in practice, we cheat a little bit. So we do have the hamburger bun. We have uh, one or two other bread recipes in the book. Um, we have no dessert, except we have about three or four ice creams. And we have a, a creme brulee and a this and a that. So we probably have a half a dozen really cool uh, dessert things. But mostly, we don't do that. It's one of the possible things we, we will do next is to do a, a pastry baking and dessert book, although we haven't officially decided to do that yet. Um, one of the really frequent questions I get is people say, so the book's done, what next? And I say, how about what I'm doing right now? Because, <laughs> in fact, I'm going around talking to people like this all the time now, and probably will through the end of the year. Yeah? Uh, most surprising kitchen myth debunk for you as you did the research. So there was a bunch of kitchen myths that we already knew about that other people had debunked. Probably the the single most surprising one for us, uh, I'll tell you two. Um, one is that plunging things into ice water doesn't stop the cooking. Um, everyone thinks that, oh yeah, you plunge into ice water to stop the cooking. And it's a logical fallacy that's very similar to uh, Galileo disproving that heavier objects fall faster. It made perfect logical sense that heavier objects should fall faster, right? They're heavier. Only it turns out 
The world doesn't work that way. Well, in the same way, when you, if you imagine a piece of food, imagine this as a piece of food, heat is moving from the outside in while you're cooking it because the outside's hotter. If you're not, you're not still cooking it. It's, it's done cooking. Uh, the heat is going to move in at a rate that depends on several things, but it's primarily bottlenecked by the, uh, the thermal uh, conductivity or, or some, actually something called the diffusivity of the, um, uh, of the material. So it's moving at this characteristic rate. So if I have, imagine a pulse of heat here at the outside, that pulse of heat will move to the inside at this rate. Well, now suppose I plunge it in ice water. Now I'm putting a pulse of cold in, which is negative heat, but colloquially we could call it a pulse of cold. It moves at the same speed. So it can't ever overtake that. So if by what you mean by stop cooking is you want to stop the maximum temperature that the interior reaches, it will always reach the same temperature. And it's exactly like saying, suppose that you and I are both driving somewhere, and we both go 30 miles an hour, and you leave five minutes ahead of you. Will I ever catch you? No, <laughs> I can't. And for this reason, you can't ever catch it. But I discovered this. It makes perfect sense after the fact. We discovered this uh, while I was doing modeling. I was curious about this, and so I did a mathematical model of it. And it showed, and then, of course, we tried it, and it kind of has to work. Um, the other great one is uh, there's a cooking method called uh, confit, uh, where you cook things in oil or fat. And any chef will tell you that there's a characteristic texture, this wonderful, rich, silky texture you get to meet by cooking it slowly in fat. It's complete bullshit. Um, I, I love confit. I love eating it. It's fantastic stuff. But I was wondering, when we were writing the meat chapter, what, how the hell does that work? How does the oil get inside, all the way to the center? It couldn't possibly, because the oil molecules are really big. They couldn't diffuse in. There's nowhere near enough time. So it couldn't possibly be true. So we did a bunch of blind taste tests where we would take the same meat. The traditional thing to do in France is uh, duck legs. So we take duck legs. We would cook it traditionally immersed in fat. And then we also would steam it. And as long as we kept the time and the temperature the same, in a blind taste test afterwards, none of us could tell. So. There wasn't. Now, I tell this to chefs, and they get almost violently angry and say, <laughs> I, I don't agree with this. And I say, well, you know, that's your first problem. Because this isn't about agreeing. OK? <laughs> you should try it. And if you try a controlled experiment, nature is right. It doesn't matter <laughs> whether you agree or disagree. Now, if you try the experiment and you really feel you can tell, well, great. That, that's great for you. But you have to take an empirically oriented view of this. And that's one of the interesting things in the book, and it's one of the interesting mindset issues, is uh, if nature acts a certain way, that really is the way th that people work. You know, I, I get some people who have a food philosophy or an ideology that borders on religion, where they will tell me things like, uh, you know, why are you putting science in the kitchen? It will suck all of the uh, soul out of cooking. And I'll say, well, you know, I hate to tell you this, but the science is already in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, the laws of physics are the laws of physics, and they're going to happen this way. And the, it's not a question of whether you take the laws of science in or out of the kitchen. It's whether you have ignorance in or out of the kitchen. Um, that's not, it doesn't always win them over when I put it that way. But um, Yeah? I, how did you choose to leave out beer? <laughs> um, and what you drink with your hamburger? <laughs> So, um, you know, I'm not that much of a beer drinker. I think that's probably why we left beer out. But the other reason is we weren't making wine, nor would we be making beer. Mostly what our wine chapter is about is debunking lots of myths. And frankly, there's fewer myths about beer. But beer is a little bit more straight up the way it is, where it is, you know, in... So we have a big section where we discuss the subjective nature of wine tasting. Um, it, and there's all these wonderful experiments that have been done. There's a French psychologist who did a set where he would take white wine and food coloring and dye the, the white wine red and then offer the same wine, two different colors, to a bunch of wine experts and get their opinions. Um, uh, there's another great experiment where they took uh, uh, the uh, high, uh, a, a big vineyard, it was Chateau Latour, and there's a second label called Lafort de Latour, which is about a third the price of Latour. 
And so they did these things called triangle tests, which we discuss in the book quite a bit. And you should try this with any food that you're interested in. You take, uh, you have so one person make three samples of two different foods. So one of them is repeated. And the question is, can you tell the odd man out? Which one is, is different? And of course, you have one person repair it and someone else do it blind. And it's amazing how much your senses can be fooled by the order in which you taste things, by lots of other stuff. And it's amazingly hard to pick that one thing that's different. Obviously, there's a strong difference you can, but if it gets subtle, you can't. So, uh, in this one test, uh, the Fort de la Tour uh, could be told which one was that, it could be told about 40% of the time. Now, 33% would be random, so it's only slightly better than random. But the funny thing is, then they, of the people who could tell, a majority preferred Le Fort de la Tour. <laughs> so with, uh, we had lots of material like that for wine. There's tons of it because it's got so much mythology uh, around it. For beer, I wasn't aware of anything that we could say that was interesting. The same thing about tea. We don't really discuss tea in the book in detail. We have a cool way of making tea in an ultrasonic bath. <laughs> it's like the best way to make tea. But, but there was no mythology for us to uh, reform. Okay, another question? There was one in the back before, but you know, okay, whatever, here. Yeah, um, sous vide machines and vacuum sealers have sort of jumped from your lab into the home. What do you think the next formerly medical or scientific technology is going to be to cross that chasm? That's a good question. Um, uh, I think uh, steam ovens, at one level or another. Um, if you cook with low temperature steam, it's either an alternative to using a water bath for a sous vide. You also can cook things that won't fit so well in a plastic bag. Um, so, for example, we use a low-temperature steam oven to make um, creme brulee or other kinds of custards. If you put the custard in a bag, of course, it'll cook perfectly well, but it kind of doesn't look so good then. Um, and you can buy little $150 tabletop convection ovens today. There's no fundamental reason that couldn't be a steam oven in, in a few years. So I think that's one that would be pretty easy for people to accept, uh, maybe even easier than a, a water bath. Uh, another one is called a rotor stator homogenizer. So in a uh, blender, you've got some blades that spin around. And the blades are spinning freely. There's nothing else around them. And as a result, what the blade is acting against is simply the inertia of the fluid. So when it hits the fluid, and that makes the, either hits the little particle of food to break it or to shear the, the fluid. Um, what you use in a lab, something called a rotor stator homogenizer that has a spinning thing like that, and has another thing that, that's stationary, and it comes really close, hundredth of an inch, something like that. That forces all of the fluid through that little gap, that hundredth of an inch gap, and that by having something to push against, it's just radically more uh, effective. Uh, it's, so all this is is a different kind of a blender, and so it ought to be cheap, but today if you buy them from a lab equipment thing, they're thousands of dollars. Um, there's no reason it shouldn't be the same price as a Vitamix or some other nice blender. I'm sure we'll see those in the kitchen in a few years. And who knows, over time more. Yes, in the back? When do you think the book will be back in stock on Amazon.com? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm really not good at estimating. Um, I, I, four and a half years ago, I made the first outline for the book. And I went back and compared it. And it's almost exactly what we wrote. The difference is, at the top of the outline, it said, estimated page budget, 600 pages. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I estimated in the other direction. When our first printing was 6,000 copies, and we sold them out before any of them arrived. Uh, and so they have all, by this week, everyone who ordered those, pretty much maybe by next week for some, uh, some people that live far enough away that it's slow uh, to get to them, uh, those should all be distributed uh, to the world. I ordered 25,000 as soon as we saw the sales spiking up, but it takes four months to get them from China. So they'll be coming in June. June 13th, I think, the first boat leaves China, which means in June and July, those all should be coming. But of course, people have been ordering the book in the meantime. So uh, we've got all these projections. And I, I did a whole bunch of actual more computer models this weekend. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it probably it will be mid-August uh, before the, the book is like totally in stock, 24-hour ship from Amazon, that kind of thing. It, it turns out there's lots of things I've learned about this whole process. One is the crazy way things get shipped. Um, Amazon and other retailers have done this interesting optimization that makes it this 
adds a week or two to this whole schedule. They place all of these service centers in places where it's quick, assuming the book was in stock at the service center, it's quick to get to people. But they put them in places that are almost impossible to get to because they assume that's a slow process. So if you say, what's the quickest way to get a book in stock, that's what Amazon optimized for. It's not a quick way if you're shipping from China. So there's a, one of their service centers is in southern Illinois. And we, it, the, literally the books land in Seattle, on um, Port of Seattle. They get moved onto rail cars and they go by rail to this place in there, and then they go by truck for the last 100 miles, and it takes 10 days, which is ludicrous because there's all these Amazon service centers that's passing, but a certain fraction of the thing has to go there. But all of those things won't really matter by the time it gets July, August. Yep. Uh, really enjoying the blog as I read through the book, so a great companion to it. Um, as I've been looking at some of the recipes, I have no idea where to get some of these things. <laughs> Sodium citrate, or I wouldn't even know where it looks. Have you thought about uh, okay. using? The There's box? this thing called the internet. <laughs> Perhaps one of your friends here will tell you about it. <laughs> um, no, it turns out so you picked an interesting one. Sodium citrate is in every grocery store uh, because it's uh, used in Passover. It's called sour salt, and so in the kosher section of essentially any store that has a kosher kosher section, there's sodium citrate. Uh, but you can also get it online. Uh, a lot of the other ingredients that seem to be weird ingredients, there's something called xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is distributed by a company called Bob's Red Mill. And there's a little Bob's Red Mill section of pancake mixes and flours in every Safeway and every Whole Foods and every everything. So most of the stuff, surprisingly, you can just get locally, no problem. Uh, there are a few things that are a little bit more exotic, uh, but websites have, have sprouted up. Um, here's one where make sure you spell it right or you'll get a surprise with a thing. It's called Chef Rubber. <laughs> um, there's lots of other rubber websites that have a different orientation, but Chef Rubber um, started off as a wet website selling flexible molds to pastry chefs. That's why it's called Chef Rubber. It was about rubber uh, uh, molds. Uh, they have a whole set of all of these weird ingredients. Um, but really, a surprising number you can buy right down the street in Seattle, no problem. Um, yes? Who designed the books? <coughs> uh, so we had a team of people that, that designed the books. Uh, we hired a full-time art director. Uh, we tried using an outside art director, and that really didn't work very well. So we just hired a guy full-time um, who was uh, the art director from Scientific American. Um, now, partly that's because the editor-in-chief for the book, I am Wait Gibbs, uh, was uh, from Scientific American, and so we, we knew people there. But a science magazine also struck us as a good model because they would have photos and things, but they'd also have lots of graphs and things that are a little bit more technical. So the guy, his name is Mark Clemens, so he was the main uh, art director. But we all kibitzed, um, which probably made the book worse than if he'd done it himself, but by God, we all did. Um, and the photos were all taken, or almost all taken, by two people. Um, uh, started off only being me, uh, and then uh, I hired an assistant, and pretty soon my assistant was had, had more time and was better at it than I was, so he, he did most of the photos. Um, yeah? So through all this uh, wine tasting and recipe tasting that, you, that went to the making of this book, did you ever keep track of any uh, health metrics, like say, for example, when you were having, like, I don't know, having eggs or having that burger? Uh, the effects it had on... Um... So, the health effects are an interesting topic two ways. First of all, Kevin, who's known me for a long time, will tell you that I'm actually way less now than when I was at Microsoft by a, actually a fairly substantial margin. Um, so I actually lost weight while doing a cookbook, um, which is surprising until you realize 2,400 pages to proofread is, is really quite a lot. Um, we have a whole chapter called Food and Health. And the reason we have the chapter on Food and Health is... Initially, because people said, oh, God, you've got this stuff called xanthan gum, and isn't your food all full of chemicals? We'd say, yeah, and it's actually full of elements, too. Because, <laughs> um, of course, everything is a chemical. But we, wanted, we took it seriously, so we, had a, we wrote a whole section on what are the health implications of these things like xanthan gum, which are weird ingredients that you've not heard of, or agar, or other things. 
And it turns out uh, those have been, the, the difference between these new ingredients and older things is the new ones have been tested. And so you actually know they're safe, and the old ones you frankly don't. Um, most things we eat fall, uh, for the FDA, they fall under a category called grass, generally recognized as safe, which means no one ever tested it. Um, a lot of people believe that if you took sucrose, ordinary table sugar, and you subjected it to the full battery of FDA tests, it would not pass. Because it causes cavities, it causes all, I mean, there's all this, this, these things that it undeniably causes. And so people would vote not to allow us to have sucrose. It's not such a crazy thing because uh, 150 years ago, sucrose was bought in an apothecary store. It was treated like it was a drug or an, or an unusual ingredient. And it was only uh, when people found ways of making it really cheaply uh, that, in fact, it moved over to become something that was uh, a really common food item. Uh, so then after doing the stuff on those ingredients and having a whole thing discussing the scientific evidence, I had someone say, okay, fine, I got it. You're not going to kill me with a xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is fine. Actually, xanthan gum is made by bacterial fermentation, so if you don't like it, you better not have vinegar, because vinegar is also made by bacterial fermentation. Very similar uh, process. Okay, so this person said, look, you're not going to kill me with xanthan, but you still have foie gras and butter, and isn't this just horrible? So we decided to say, well, let's look up all of the, the best statistical evidence on those things. And we discovered that, in fact, many of the things that sort of everyone knows are bad for you, in fact, there's very little or very weak statistical evidence that it is bad for you. So, for example, there is no correlation, uh, no statistical correlation between eating saturated fat and either heart disease or cancer. Now, we all know no one, in quotes, the, the opposite. You're supposed to eat low fat this and so on and so forth. But it turns out the best current statistical studies show there isn't any correlation. Uh, there's no correlation between eating fiber and colon cancer. And in fact, we tell that whole story in the book because it's sort of an interesting story. Uh, a British surgeon uh, had this idea, just his random idea, that maybe fiber would reduce it. He never did any tests. He wrote a popular book on it. And the thing that really made fiber take off, which has made many of these other things take off, is a food company, in that case it was Kellogg's, decided they would start advertising that Raisin Bran was good for you. And the FDA didn't stop them. And when they didn't stop the health claim for fiber for that, that caused a tremendous number of food companies to jump on the bandwagon because health is the way they can sell you a bunch of stuff. And they frankly, they took a bunch of sawdust and they put it in your yogurt and your muffins and everything else so they could say it was high fiber. Um, and even if fiber, natural fiber, was good for you, it's not clear that the fiber supplements they put in, which literally was sawdust and things like that, was, was going to do the same thing. Well, it takes a long time to test these things and people did eventually do four different very controlled, very good studies of fiber in the diet and its effect on colon cancer, and that's none. Zero. But here, here's one that's even worse. Uh, there's a study called the Nurses Study that studied the health of 86,000 nurses for 25 years. And it was one of the big landmark uh, diet and health studies. One segment of the nurses ate butter, the other ate margarine. And in that era, the reason you would eat margarine, the primary reason, was it was polyunsaturated, so it must be better for you. Only in that era, margarine was made of trans fats. So in fact, the butter eaters had no higher uh, coronary death rate than anyone else, and the margarine eating group had four times the death rate. So in fact, well-meaning people saying, oh, you ought to eat polyunsaturates, killed a lot of folks. Because they had people, and not only did they kill them, <laughs> they made them eat margarine first. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Anyway, it was a controversial chapter, we, and uh, some of the people in the book, or in the book team said, look, why are we going to pick a fight with this? You're going to have lots of activists that get upset. I said, look, our book is for food lovers, and if I tell them that bacon is not so bad for them, how mad are they going to be? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question. Yes. What's your favorite recipes from the book? From favorite recipes. Probably the one... Well, here's one definite favor is the one I cook for myself most often, and that's a scrambled egg recipe that we have in the book, which I make a couple times a week. 
Uh, and I'll tell you the key secret of it right now, and you can do it at all at home, because half of it is about how the ingredients and half is about equipment. So on the ingredient side, if you're making a three egg scrambled eggs, throw one egg quite away. So two whole eggs and one egg yolk. It makes it yellower, it makes it creamier. It, it, to my taste, it's infinitely better scrambled eggs, no matter how you cook it. Uh, the next thing we do is we cook it in a steam oven or a sous vide because we can control the temperature exactly. And that always makes it perfect every time. So that's probably my single favorite recipe. And it involves nothing very exotic, but, but that's okay. Okay? Terrific. <laughs>